Hey friends, hope you guys are still doing okay. Um, I'm still in the backyard. I haven't really left, I guess. Lots of things to do back here. Anyways, today I guess I'm gonna talk to you about plant structure and function as much as I can. So, uh, first let's go over, let's go over the basic parts of a tree. You guys probably know the basic parts of a tree. But maybe you don't know all the different nomenclature. Okay, so here, this is a pretty one. This thing behind me, it's a little Japanese maple. And you probably know a tree trunk, right? At the base there. But maybe you don't know that as you go up that trunk um, and there's a divergence, every divergence has a different name. So it goes up and forms what we call branches branches and then off of those branches we have limbs and then off of those limbs we have twigs and this all has to do with uh, basic growth patterns where growth comes from and different tissue types and so forth so let's see if I can find us a good example that we can use to go over all the different basic parts that involve growth in a plant. Uh, we'll use this uh, fig. So, all right. Here, we're looking at a pot. That's a little miniature fig tree. Hope you can see that. It's so bright out here today. So, hold on a second. Let me turn this around. All right, so if you look at this little fig tree, got these stems one day they'll be big enough to be called trunks and what we have here are you can see these different little sections see these little lines here these little sections right here okay focus that oh much better these little sections right here these are called nodes and you can see some of these little nodes have buds coming off of them so nodes are just areas where we have branch um, and limb development and where you see buds form and buds uh, are basically just these tiny little packages of embryonic tissue that can they can go on to become um, their little let me focus that other little shoots but also little leaves where you'll see growth now the space between this these little areas, these are called the internodes, right? So internode, node, area of growth. And then these little things are called buds. And these things uh, are filled with apical meristem. Meristem is just one of the, those are the undifferentiated cell types that we see in plants that give rise to growth. Now here, right here, this thing, it's called a leaf scar. Now there was a leaf the year before stem so apical meristem just says undifferentiated cells that give rise to growth um, there's also another type of meristem called lateral meristem there's a couple other meristems we'll talk about lateral meristem um, causes width wide growth apical meristem undifferentiated cells at the tip of buds that's going to be responsible for growth remember buds can uh, give rise to leaves they can also give rise to shoots. And of course they can give rise to flowers. Let's see if we can find a flower bud, hold tight. Oh yes, here we go. This is our purple leaf plum. No leaves on it quite yet, not on the specimen. Here's some flower buds. We're gonna open up and give us our flowers that we talked about last time. Last time we talked about dioecious flowers, which we had to mention. Some plants, y'all, they have both boy and girl parts in their flowers. Um, and some plants have separate male and female flowers. Hazelnuts, for example. Alright, so we looked at the parts of a fig tree. Um, looked at its leaves. Y'all, figs are awesome, by the way. I think, I think I've read that, to my knowledge, they're the... Uh, the oldest cultivated fruit tree. Ancient Egyptians were cultivating those things. 
I think like 5,000 years ago. I don't think a lot of people realize how long we've been cultivating things, by the way. We've, uh, we've been going, we've been growing rye for like 13,000 years or something like that. And then a thousand years after that, there's evidence of, uh, bottle gourds and, uh, gourds can be emptied out and were probably used as the first vessels to carry water and then another thousand years after that so like 11,000 years ago that's when we started cultivating things that you guys are probably familiar with like wheat and so forth um okay so this is all fig tree what we're gonna talk about next is how the heck you figure out what kind of tree a, a tree is so usually you use these things called uh, dichotomies or dichotomy keys, and a dichotomy is just a, a just two choices, right? And a dichotomy key, you're gonna have to figure out certain characteristics about trees. The easiest way to ID trees is using their leaves. Now um, we looked at this Japanese maple a second ago. So these, let me just pull one off. <laughs> It's gonna hurt my heart a little bit. So this, okay. This little stem thing down here, this is called a pedial, this little thing right here. And then each side of the leaf, those are called blades. Most of y'all only think of blades like blades of grass, but each side of that leaf is that blade. Now, this leaf uh, is called lobed, just because anything that basically looks like a mitten or, or a handprint or anything like that. Oaks and maples, lobed leaves. They've, so they've usually got their own little branch on a dichotomy key. Other leaves basically look very similar. They have a, um, so yeah, lobed leaves, maples, oaks. Uh, I'll keep it that simple for now because it's enough to try to keep track of all this stuff. Other leaves look like your quintessential leaf type, right? Here, this is a gardenia leaf. Gardenias, you can see smooth outer edge, oval shape, and listen, we could get into crazy detail with leaf shapes. There's obovate, or obovate, an elliptical, and then and and we can look at leaf margins and stuff like that. Hi, Peaky. Hi. Say hello. Hi. So we can look at leaf margins in a number of different ways. They can be smooth, they can be serrated, they can be doubly serrated, as they're called. Uh, but basically, when we look at leaves, they can be arranged in two main ways, okay? So let me, let me show you these. Okay, so when we look at this gardenia, uh, gardenias bloom white, they have this really potent smell, they're used commonly for household products, candles, and stuff like that. I'm gonna cut this thing down, it's getting out of control. Um, if you look at the arrangement of leaves along, along the stem, you can see that these gardenia leaves are directly across from each other, right here. These two pedials, right here, grew from buds above a node. I'm just gonna bring back terminology. And you can see that they're directly across from each other. This is called opposite arrangement. So if you were following a dichotomy key, you'd be like, okay, you go up, you, and one of these is in the presentation that I'll post. I made one in Microsoft Paint with my mad skills, uh, using the trees only found on campus, just to make it a little easier for Ecology Lab. But there's far less opposite leaf trees in the area than there are alternate. So we'll find one alternate next, because that's what most trees are. All right, so next we're looking for uh, something with alternate leaf arrangement. Hmm. Okay, this thing right here, this is called an anise uh, tree. It'll grow into a tree if you let it. It's more like a shrub. The difference between a shrub and a tree, usually just basic size. Trees uh, have the potential to grow like more than 10 feet. And that's just a really loose definition. There are others. Um, anise has this lov lovely licorice smell. And it also um, is often used as a spice to little what's left over from the flowers. This is a native species, though, and not the exotic anise that, that we think of. You've probably seen that and, and thought the word anise before, or maybe you haven't had that thought at all. But in any case, 
let's look at the way this one's laid out. Okay, so if you look at this anise, you can see along the shrub here that these leaves, petioles, come off and they're offset from one another. They're not directly across. And that, hopefully trying to not give you guys a headache. I know the last video was very, very bumpy. Um, okay, so once again, you follow one of these stems, you can see that these leaves are arranged in a alternating pattern and are considered alternate. Now, there are lots of other ways that we can think about leaf arrangement. Oh, here's a weird example. So this is called Carolina Cranes Bill. There's a ton of it in here. And it's actually one of our only native weeds. Um, none of the Cranes Bill in here is blooming at the moment. I'll see if I can find some here in a little bit. Uh, but we can see that these leaves are arranged in a, in a totally different pattern. Um, this is called whorled. And some leaves on larger plants are arranged that way. And look at this weird one. It's a totally different color. Now, that one's either stressed out, it's not happy where its roots are. That is not what, in the, in the presentation, um, or in your text, you, you read about something called phenotypic plasticity. That's not an example of that. We'll look at that here in a little bit. Phenotypic plasticity is typically where, oh God, sorry, you guys are still staring at these things. Hold on a second. I'll give you an example of it in a minute. Hey, look, I found some that's uh, blooming. So here's some cranes built. This is a type of geranium that's blooming here locally. Um, it's usually a much lighter pink, so this is probably some weird hybrid between the wild weed and the, uh, the garden variety of geraniums that you see laying around. You also see this rosette style of leaf arrangement, where the leaves are arranged in a rosette. Alright, so that's a little bit about leaf arrangement, how leaves are arranged. Uh, Oh, what about, what about pine needles, you say? Well, here, I've got some pine needles. I happen to tear down for Evie on a walk. So let's take a look at some of this. So pine needles, these highly specialized leaf types, usually found in extreme environments, extreme hot, extreme cold, for example. Uh, these little things right here, these are cool. Little things are called candles, and those will become the new pine needles. Now, the Japanese use this technique called Milwaukee, where they go through and they candle their pine trees and like reduce the number of these so that they'll grow thicker and more controlled. It's basically like the large scale version of bonsai, really, really fascinating. So, pine needles, for example, take a look at this one. The way you figure out pine needles is you have to grab a hold of one of these and look at the bundle, okay? So, God, let me try to get this to focus. Set that down. So you can see that in this particular type of pine, we've got two needles in a bundle, and they have this twisted effect. And usually pine needles are either flat or twisted, and they come in a certain number of bundles. Now, it can be tricky because this shortleaf pine kind of looks like uh, Virginia pine, so you also oftentimes need to pay attention to the pine cones, which if they're not full grown can also throw you off, but still help aid in uh, identification. If we look at this over here, this, this is an eastern white pine. This thing has five flat needles in a bundle. So that's how we ID pine trees. So really cool, highly adapted leaf type for extreme environments. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about more leaf adaptations. Okay, so not just the entire leaf, but uh, leaves in general have 
adaptations. Many of them have tiny little hairs, some of them visible with the naked eye. I think I have something around here. Um, so some leaves have these things called trichomes, which are these hairy-like projections that, that function to maximize surface area. And kind of like the entire leaf in pines, um, trichomes essentially are used for since they're maximizing surface area, what they're doing is uh, they're maximizing that reflectivity. Basically, they kind of work um, from a light theory perspective, like tint on a car. They function to so they they help with insulation when it's uh, when it's cold outside. They help with evaporative cooling when it's too hot outside. Now I think I've got some I can show you in these seeds. All right, hold on. So, let's see. Yeah, here, okay. So this plant right here is called, what the heck is the common name? It's called Verbena bonariensis. Ooh, look, here's all these. You can see all these tiny little hairs covering the leaves. Those are those trichomes. So these uh, are a type of dermal tissue which is one of the three main types of tissue in plant cells. Um, and dermal tissue is used to create uh, guard cells, which we cannot see with the naked eye, right? Those are those little tiny hole-shaped things that open and close in response to evaporation, and they help with uh, transpirational pull so that water can be moved throughout the plant. They also help with uh, gas exchange of O2 and CO2, right? So that's another type of dermal tissue. And there's also these things called pavement cells, which help for, they help uh, protect the tissue on the outside. Usually a lot of leaves also have a waxy coating for protection as well. So here we've got these trichomes. All right, so the next thing that we can talk about is uh, roots. The part of the plant you don't see that's underground. So when we think about roots, we think of like this quintessential root system underneath the ground. The root system is usually as good as as big as the crown is, or the upper part of the uh, the tree. So you can imagine. Let me turn this around. So that right there at the end of the side yard is a. This is a green ash. Now, one thing we didn't talk about, because there are no examples of them growing at the moment, and I'll have to do a follow-up video with it once there finally are, but we didn't talk about, so that's the crown of an ash tree. That one, based on my measurements. So to figure out how old a tree is, we know there are various growth rates. You just measure what's called DBH or diameter of breast height, and then you can use a basic, uh, growth rate multiplier and figure out how old the trees are. That one is almost 400 years old. There's another oak tree up here. It's about that same age. Now let's talk about how that makes us feel. That makes me feel so, uh, so puny in comparison. So anyways, the crown of that tree is gigantic and the root system is probably even bigger, which is kind of mind blowing and hard to think about. The ash trees have what's called compound leaves, and compound leaves, uh, they have petioles with multiple leaflets on them, so they're really tricky to look at. So we're looking for roots, and there's multiple different types of specialized roots outside of the ones that serve to anchor the plant uh, in some substrate where they absorb nutrients and water and so forth and associate with that fungal mycelia that really increase their uh, their surface area. So I'm gonna go through for a walk in the woods back here, I think. Now, what I'm looking for is poison ivy because poison ivy has these anchor roots. Oh, boom, piece of cake. Okay, so. This huge, can you see that? There it is. This huge poison ivy vine, which has not leafed out, so we can't see anything, has these anchor roots to attach it to this tree and grow up it. One of the funniest moments in field ecology was when 
we were doing tree IDs and somebody pulled off a poison ivy leaf and they were like, what tree is this? I was like, oh, that's poison ivy. And they're like, oh, okay. So, leaves of three, let it be. There's also another saying right here that says, raggy rope, don't be a dope. People confuse this for Virginia creeper for some reason. I am not sure why because creeper has uh, only three leaves on it. I guess because they're both climbing vines. God, can you see that beautiful red bud behind me? Look at that thing. Pink blooms, red bud because it has red buds. So now we're looking for other root types. Now there are some roots. I don't have any of them here. But on campus, good God, that limb broke. Okay, um, on campus, there are these trees called bald cypress, and bald cypress trees have these specialized roots called nematophores, which function to breathe for the tree when they're rooted in areas that have uh, lots of water. So they're flooded, or they're usually near ponds and so forth, or they're literally in ponds. Or lakes or rivers slow moving rivers and those nematophores are like they're basically like snorkels and they uh, function in, in, in gas exchange so what we're looking for next is those are pretty flowers look at these guys can you see those I haven't noticed those yet um, what we're looking for next are these things called prop roots Prop roots are hard to find this time of year too, but I've got some on a plant called a dragon's blood tree in a uh, in the grow room in the back of the house. And creepily enough, somebody from the last video emailed and was like, show us your grow room. So we'll go in here next, okay? All right, so here's a grow room. It's glowing pink. A lot of plants down here. These are all agaves. This is called Plectranthus. Something you might recognize as a bird of paradise. Bougainvillea. Stuff out there is called papyrus. So, um, in the. Oh, uh, yeah. This is all of our. It's all our fallout gear, guys. Um, this thing is doing well. Anyways, here we go. Here's a dragon's blood tree. So, here. If you look at the base of this dragon's blood tree, you can see that we have those prop roots that literally prop the plant up. Also kind of function like nematophores, but super useful in areas where plants grow in really rocky habitats. It allows their roots to grow around the rocky, the rocky substrate that they're trying to grow on, okay? to prop roots. Bamboos. Have a fig tree. Okay, now we're gonna look for storage roots next. Okay. So I'm looking for storage roots. We had so if you've ever drawn drive wow. If you've ever driven by a uh, field and it's full of something that doesn't look like it's growing vegetables, but it typically looks like it would, like some kind of farmland. Usually it's filled with some kind of crop that's trying to reinvigorate the soil because our monoculture crops strip all of the nutrients from the soil, particularly if we use a lot of um, herbicides and pesticides and so forth. They, they destroy that, that fungal mycelia that service, you know, connections between plants and so forth. Uh, it's interesting to think about the fact that so plants communicate through that fungal mycelia and uh, if you think about monoculture food crops there's no communication going on in there so what I'm looking for next is a type of storage root and I'm probably gonna have to use what's called forage radish or daikon and uh, hold on that's what this is daikon and we're gonna look at it and all the different parts of it. All right, so here's the inside of daikon or forage radish, which I threw out a few years ago to help enrich the soil so that like it'll push through that hard clay and break it down 
increase the aeration and then kind of compost and you can see this one's actually dying back already here in the center but um a carrot's a little easier to do this with i'm gonna grow carrots because carrots take forever to uh to grow and they make a mess they self seed like crazy in fact so these things do that too and they kind of drive me nuts but in any case um i hope you can see that so there's a little bit of a darker area here in the very middle of this and there's a diagram in your presentation that kind of shows the same thing but that darker area it's probably having a hard time focusing because it's white um that darker area is um that middle area is called that vascular tissue it forms from what we call procambian procambium not procambian not the cambian era we're talking about procambium and so procambium is just one of those primordial tissues that give rise to a lot of different things specifically procambium gives rise to vascular tissue uh, and that vascular tissue we know goes on to become xylem and phloem and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we I'm gonna slice open some celery here in a little bit um, but then and outside of that we have what's called ground tissue, which forms from ground marrow stem. And uh, this gives rise to a lot of specialized tissues like parenchyma. Parenchyma are like kind of what we think of as, as most standard plant cells. This is your mesophyll cells that house like all your photosynthesizing parts and pigments. And uh, it's basically the pith, the center of most plants, particularly in limbs and trunks we'll look at here in a little bit. And it also, um, so the parenchyma, mesophyll, photosynthesizing pigments, pith, all the filler. Uh, the ground tissues, y'all, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The nomenclature doesn't. The ground tissues, uh, I'm just going to sit here and just slowly rub this dike on while we talk. So the ground tissues are basically any type of tissue that isn't vascular or dermal in nature. So we talked about dermal structures like guard cells that open and close for, for gases, pavement cells that serve for protection, and those trichomes, which are those specialized cells. Oh, we didn't talk about the fact that some plants in North Carolina have highly specialized trichomes. Sundews are a type of carnivorous plant where their trichomes have adapted to have this sticky outer substance on the outside of them. God, it's bright and uh, a little tiny fly lands on them and they kind of wrap up. It's on, the, it's on the cover of some biology textbooks. They're very cool. Uh, they're very small. So kind of like Venus fly traps. The first time you see one, you're like, oh, that's cool, but it would be cooler if it was bigger, you know? Um, so ground tissues, anything that aren't vascular or dermal in nature, and they include those, those specialized cell types that we call parenchyma, and you can't differentiate between any of those when you look at the inside of a storage root. Just know that the darker layer is typically vascular tissue in a storage root, and outside of that, in between the outer layer and the inner layer is that ground tissue. And that's parenchyma, and parenchyma gives rise to what we call sclerenchyma, which is comprised of sclerids and fibers, and we'll talk more about those when we look inside of a, a tree trunk because I've got a good section of one to check out here in a little bit because who doesn't have those at the house? Uh, so parenchyma, sclerenchyma, which function for structural support. Oh, actually, I'll go grab some, uh, I'll go grab some yucca and we can actually look at some specialized sclerenchyma. And then there's another type of support tissue that's pretty extra, just serves as extra support. And we call that colonchyma, okay? Now sclerenchyma typically associate with a lot of other cell types you find them are surrounding xylem and phloem for example and those sclerenchyma cells can either be lignified or cellulosic and the lignified sclerenchyma those lignified fibers surround xylem I think specifically and then the cellulosic fibers surround the phloem very specifically so let's take a look at some of those vascular tissues here next in a uh, and some, I'll get some celery, all type. All right, you guys see those little circles down at the bottom here of the celery? These are is easily visible vascular bundles. 
Now, this if celery stalks were fully circular, it would go all the way around because this is a unicot and it has that circular arrangement of vascular bundles rather than interdispersed. Let's see if I can cut down some irises here in a second and see that. So, unicot basically uh, the classification. I'll keep this simple. The classification for dicots. Uh, that don't include magnolias. Remember we looked at those magnolias last time. So here are these vascular bundles here and here We've got xylem which are those um, tracheids and and plants that flower also vessel elements and in fact the vessel elements are a little larger Make this a little more visible. So and remember so so xylem tracheids vessel elements only tracheids in conifers and we'll talk about the differentiation between their locations and, and throughout wood here in a little bit. But here we're looking at an angiosperm, which is weird to think about celery that way, huh? But it's so, it, it, uh, it flowers. So vascular bundles, visible. Um, another really cool thing that we can use celery for outside of the vascular bundles is that we can look at um, the colonchyma. So xylem, tracheids, vessel elements, there's also phloem in here. Phloem is comprised of these things called sieve tubes and companion cells that function as like sugar sources and sinks. Um, and we'll probably have to look at some animations to see how that works. Unless I can come up with a way to demonstrate sugar movement without having to do that. So let's see if we can, let's see if I can do this with one hand. Another thing that you can see in celery specifically, oh yeah, we got it. So very specifically, these strands are called colonchyma, which are just one of those support tissues that we find in some plants. Theirs happen to be long and stringy. Not all long stringy things in plants are colonchyma. Some of them are sclerenchyma, right? And just to go back a little bit, this, this colonchyma cells are, uh, these are made up of cellulose and pectin. And these come from that ground bare stem and are a type of ground tissue and are supportive. But not all stringy things in plants are colonchyma. I'm going to go find me some find me some yucca leaves here in a second and we'll look at some other types of uh, fibrous sclerenchyma that are uh, that are lignin and cellulose rather than pectin and cellulose. Okay? So either way, cool stuff. I love to eat this with peanut butter. I usually keep some in the office. Peanut butter and honey is even better. Alright. Okay, so next we're looking for yucca. Oh my god, I have to show you guys. I built made some sandals out of yucca once. I'll go get those here in a minute. So yucca is a really cool plant. Typically adapted for hot desert environments. Cut one of these leaves off for you guys. So this this is a yucca leaf. You can even see some of the the fibers hanging off of it, which are just a type of sclerenchyma. And you can try and pull these things apart. Okay. So I scraped some of the outer layer off this yucca leaf. Now you can see how all the sclerenchyma cell fibers are running down the length of it. Um, yeah, we get a lot of plant fibers this way. This is where we make jute rope and stuff of that nature. We use flax to make rope out of the flax plant. Uh, we also eat the seeds of flax, so it's so healthy. All right, so next we're gonna see if we can take a peek inside of a, uh, a monocot stem. Oh, first let me show you my uh, Y'all, check out my, uh, check out my yucca sandals. Love these bad boys. God, can you even see this? Hold on. Bam. Yucca leaf sandals. Thank you, yucca. And you too. Okay, so next we need a knife. And a monocot. These things all through here. Monocots. Right here. These are all irises interdispersed in and amongst um, other things. Let's see what other things I can find you. 
This is Columbine. This is, oh, here's something that you guys may have heard of before. This is Echinacea. One of the many, since this is a cottage style garden, it's mostly like cherry plants. Y'all, the Piedmont of North Carolina used to be filled with prairies. Uh, Native Americans controlled a lot of the, the layout of the land before European settlement, and they would do a lot of controlled burns to keep the understory and woodland areas open. And so, kind of in woodland glens and openings beside wooded areas, there were a lot of native Piedmont prairies. We've got a few left, very few. They're carefully maintained by the, by the county. Um, but the cool thing about prairie plants is that they, we'll, we'll take a look at, these iris roots are not like this, but prairie plants have super, super deep roots. I think there's a cool picture in one of your diagrams in, in your presentation that shows how deep prairie plants are. And I mean, we're talking, it's not like a tree where the, where the root system is similar to the crown. We're talking prairie plants maybe three feet tall, but then they can have 15 feet deep worth of roots. And that's so that in areas that burn, they can easily re-sprout and so they can get super, super deep in the water column uh, to help them deal with drought. And when you think about Midwest prairies, right, you think about these, these huge dry areas. So let me see if I can, oh, that hurts my heart a little bit. I don't even like these irises that much, but just a little. Let me see if I can, oh yeah, this is gonna be perfect. Ooh, before we walk over there with this iris piece, Y'all, yesterday we spotted, check out, daffodils usually have one bloom per stem, we found some twins. So you can see this daffodil has these two different, these are called spathes. You can see this is a twin daffodil. I don't usually like daffodils. Their genus is called Narcissus. I don't know if you guys remember the... Greek mythology tale about Narcissus who was staring at himself in the lake and admiring his beauty for so long that he fell in and drowned. But these daffodils, or daffodils, I don't know how they got that name, Narcissus. But, twins, pretty cute. Oh, can you see that? It's pretty hard to, to tell. But you see all those dark little circles? Those are the vascular bundles in a monocot being evenly distributed throughout the stem. Rather than a range of these concentric patterns with this pith in the center and the cortex spread throughout, this has this equal spread. I hope you guys can see some of that. Can we zoom in without it getting blurry? Ooh, try to hold it still in the shade. You can see those dark vascular bundles spread evenly throughout. So if you cut down like a palm tree, for example, or any of the monocots, you see this equally distributed arrangement of vascular bundles of xylem and phloem, rather than a concentric or circular pattern that you typically associate when you think of tree rings or any uticot plant. I'm going to try to hold this as steady as possible. So. Now we're looking down the center of a stem of a, of a branch that's a couple of years old. Um, and very center here, we have that pith, and then we have this concentric arrangement. We can't really see clearly vascular bundles like we do in celery or, or uh, irises and so forth. But what we can do is we can see these dark and these light rings around the inner and outer edges. And so these rings are how the xylem and foam would be arranged, but not only, so xylem and phloem come from that, uh, that ground, that, uh, oh god, sorry, hold on. It's focusing in on this grape hyacinth. No, it's not what I want. I want this. Okay. So, what we've got is we've got xylem and phloem coming from that procambium. But procambium also gives rise to, uh, vascular and cork cambium. So essentially, you can't see them really, but we've got these circular arrangements of focus, xylem and phloem. And then in the middle of that, so the first circle is, uh, uh, in theory um, that grows during that first year of growth 
we call primary xylem and phloem, but then that starts to split and widen and create secondary xylem and phloem. And during that innermost dark ring, essentially you have that vascular cambium, which is just the growth rate or the growth ring of vascular tissue. And then that outer ring, we have this growth ring of cork cambium, which gives rise to cork. And uh, together those things, I'll make the bark. And we'll take a look at and an actual old tree trunk here in a second. Okay, so the last thing I want to look at, and I've got this like fourth of a tree section that we can check out, is how these things are arranged inside of a, a tree. Now it really depends on how, how the trees grow and how old wood and late wood form, which essentially is what creates these, these strips or lines in deciduous trees. You can see, however, these tiny little black speckles. Those are actually vessel elements. So anyways, if we look at, let's look at the bark first. Let me get this to focus. So bark, the outermost protective layer, the cork, and then you can see this one dark little strip. You see that? One dark little strip. Let's see if I can get that to focus. That one dark little strip right there. That's that, that's that. Here, hold on. Can you guys see that? Okay, so right here, the thick dark strip, so cork, thick dark strip is cork cambium, which is growing the bark. And then internal to that is this vascu vascular cambium, which gives rise to a lot of the vascular tissue that grows throughout this soft wood in here. Um, now, this all together is bark. This right here, this cork, cork cambium, vascular cambium. Here, our softwood, let's see if I can get this to focus, right here, which is light in color. That's where we see, now, here's the weird thing. A lot of this is functionally dead, at least in an older tree like this, because it's comprised primarily of xylem. And so in conifers, it would be primarily tracheids, but in a angiosperm tree like this one, it's uh, got vessel elements in it too. In fact, I don't know if we can see any of those things. It's really hard to tell what this camera can see, but if you see those tiny, tiny little indentions, vessel elements are big enough to essentially see with your naked eye. If I had a magnifying glass, I did have a few, but I'm sure Evie took them and played with them. We've got our parenchyma in here, right? The pith, we've got, uh, so functional cells like mesophyll cells in certain parts of the plant here in the trunk of a tree, you don't see that. What we have is sclerenchyma, sclerids, fibers. we got that xylem that's lignified and that phloem that's cellulosic and transporting uh, phloem through here. And then xylem transporting the water through this softwood. Here, this dark area, I hope y'all can see that. So hard to tell, it's so dark here. Let's get in the shade some. Oh yeah, much clearer. I'm tapping on the wood like it's gonna focus. Focus. Uh, this dark wood right here in the center is called heartwood. That's completely dead. So in the very center of some trees, like would be deep to us, we have the pith which is literally completely empty in some trees. But this heartwood's completely dead. It's serving as nothing but structural support. And although these xylem cells that we find in the soft wood are functionally dead because their cytoplasm's all shriveled up, they're still functioning as those tubes to suck and move water around, okay? But the heartwood, not doing anything, just keeping that tree standing, okay? So lots of different ways to think about these things. Now, one of the things that's important to note is that modern-day forestry practices are so, uh, oftentimes, so, uh, I don't know what the word is, unsustainable, ridiculous. No, a lot of forestry organizations are heavily concerned with sustainability, but um, let me show you guys something. So, this is split, but this is a center, this is a tree, and you can see, see it's a tree that grows so quickly that the heartwood is hardly recognizable. 
and uh, largely absent because it's a very fast growing tree and probably heavily fertilized in an effort to grow it as quickly as possible. So these trees are weaker and the wood isn't nearly as strong. You can see the distance between each of the rings is also wider whereas in the other one they're really really close together. And this can this can vary depending on individual growth rate and whatnot but typically most modern day forestry practices the wood's weaker, it's grown quicker, it's not as strong, heartwood is hardly there or absent. All right, so, God, look at that. So that behind me, that's a dogwood starting to bloom. Kind of looks lime greeny because of those flowers opening up. really nice anyways um let's see god the azaleas are also starting to bloom a bunch i show you some of those so we've talked a lot about plant structure and function the differences between tissues we talked about the overall organization of plants or the main stem and that stem if it's huge on a tree and woody it can be a trunk uh, there's the actual leaves of a purple leaf plum. This one's already leafed out. The bigger leaves uh, leaf out quicker. Oh, that was another one of the things I wanted to show you. Look at this. This is an azalea. It's blooming. Things are starting to bloom. Kind of nice. In the current state of everything. It's always nice to wish I could have you guys all over to the backyard to hang out. We could just talk to each other from 10 feet away. One of the things I wanted to show y'all that I don't think I did. We talked about phenotypic plasticity zone. And uh, let me show you something. So here's some more Carolina geranium. But this is in the shade. Now one thing, you'll still notice this world arrangement. World, by the way, is W-H-O-R-L-E-D. World. You'll see, you'll notice this world arrangement, but you notice that this, the, um, you notice that these, these leaves are far more elongated, right? And, and that's because in shady areas, oftentimes, and this is all the way up through the tree level, you'll, you'll notice elongated growth as plants try to reach for, reach for light. You notice increased leaf surface area, um, and decreased density of the leaf growth in shady areas. And almost all plants exhibit this. And this is this phenotypic plasticity where they'll adjust their growth patterns. And the, they change down to the tissue level too um, in order to adapt to a particular environment. So we talked about overall plant structure with the stem um, and the nodes which have the buds, which have that embryonic tissue. They could be apical meristem if it's growing lengthwise, lateral meristem if it's growing widthwise. There's other types of meristem that give rise to different tissue types. Uh, we looked at the, the leaf buds and flower buds. We looked at um, how leaves are arranged. They can have this simple arrangement where it's a single petiole coming off a twig or a limb and it can be shaped like a mitten or a hand and have that lobed arrangement those leaves can be arranged opposite from each other or, or alternate and compound and hopefully we'll get some compound leaves here for the end of the semester that i can show you um what else we talked about roots the different types of roots we saw uh roots specialized for Attachment like with the poison ivy. We talked a little bit about poison ivy. We talked about uh, prop roots like in the dragon's blood tree that we saw for rocky environments. We talked about nematophores for saturated or wet environments. We talked a lot about normal roots. Uh, we looked at storage roots like with the daikon and carrots, for example. And we talked about how those were arranged with the middle tissue being vascular in the dark area and then outward from that is that ground tissue 
comes from ground meristem that gives rise to the parenchyma, which gives rise to sclerenchyma and colenchyma, or structural support tissues. And those are arranged in various ways in different types of plants and different areas of the plants. But overall, those vascular tissue in eudicots, we saw those arrangements in the celery. And we saw their different interdispersed arrangement in the iris stem. And those differences in vascular tissues, how they're arranged in a newly growing uh, tree limb all the way up to a gigantic old trunk where the center is that heartwood and then softwood out from there that's lighter in color that has um, the sclerenchymal tissues with the xylem that's transporting water and then out from that we've got that vascular cambium with the phloem y'all that's why if you tear the bark off a tree it dies right if you tear bark if you debark a tree all the way around the center um, then it dies because of that destruction to that cork and that vascular cambium level layer specifically that vascular cambium this function is to literally transport food sugar around up and down that particular plant or tree uh, and then what else yeah plant structure and function I hope y'all are good. I don't know about y'all, but I'm usually good in the daytime. I'm wonderful. And then, you know, as it gets late into the night, I'm like, I'm so alone. I'm not alone. I'm stuck in the house with these women. <laughs> Anyways, I miss you guys. I hope everybody's good. Uh, I'll be in touch soon. We'll talk about some more things. I don't know if I can figure out how to keep doing these things in my backyard. I feel like eventually when we talk about ecology and so forth, we're going to have to use pencil and paper at least. So, talk to you guys soon.